G'day legends, g'day superstars, Peps here with another season preview for 2023 and we are taking an in-depth look at, I don't know what to say, one of the top premiership contenders of the Brisbane Lions and to help me out, we've gone back to the great man himself, James Brooks all the way up there in sunny Queensland. We're about to have a chat about the team that a lot of people are saying are going to be the ones who are getting Geelong a run for their name this year. Welcome back. Great to have you uh, again for a season preview. How do you see so far uh, the Lions looking as they march towards hope September? Yeah, mate. Good to be back. Thanks for having us again, Pat. Uh, <laughs> It's a tough one because, as you sort of alluded to, a lot of uh, lot of expectation, a lot of pressure on the line this year. It is, it's got a bit of a this year or bust feeling about it. We've, obviously, we've, we've got a few more players through the door in the off season, and an already relatively strong list. Only lost in today, but I think we covered that loss with Jack Gunston. Now the premier midfielder in, pick one in the draft and then Tom McKenna for absolutely nothing. So all the ingredients are there. It's just whether we've got the, uh, the mental fortitude or the intangibles that can get it done. Intangibles, big word. Might have to put that one in the description in the chat notes just for anybody who's struggling with that one. But look, it's, the, the word down here is Brisbane, Brisbane, Brisbane. Just everything that you did off the off season was magnificent. Who came in, those players that you just mentioned a moment ago? I think Connor McKenna is the one that has slipped under the radar a bit. Gunston, you know what you're going to get. Having Dunkley go up and Ashcroft, literally two instant midfielders, just adds a lot more plus and takes a bit of pressure off Neil, takes a bit more of that pressure off Zorko. Um, but McKenna, that runoff halfback, if you can have him on one side and then you can swap that over with Rich with the long penetrating kicking or if he's, if he's going to even play... In a, in a back pocket role. We don't know yet, but you just set up nicely. What's the feeling up there in Brisbane? I know you said it's, it's a little bit of, you know, this year or bust, but is, is the pressure building club-wise, coach-wise, <laughs> it's because it's, <laughs> yeah. well, I reckon it's simmering. And if it doesn't go off to a nice start, the, those questions are going to now start turning into statements. And, well, we know what happens after a few weeks when a team isn't uh, hitting its straps. Yeah, well, round one, Port Adelaide at Adelaide Oval is a is a nice way to kick things off. It's a nice strong test, especially because they've had a decent off season as well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the coach there is, well, it's a little bit quiet there, which means one of two things: it's either getting much worse and it's being buried, or it's it's gone away. So, it's sort of just that lingering shadow there of what's going to happen with Chris Fagan, if anything, this year. And it's, I don't think it's a huge worry, but it is certainly something to consider. With and just jumping in with that, with all the stuff that happened with with Hawthorne, and then obviously with you know in taking a bit of time before Christmas, has has that been up in the news up there a bit? As it sort of simmered because it was down here for quite a while. Did that? Yeah, have it, you heard if it's affected what what happened at the club, or was it pretty much able to just take care of itself whilst he was having that bit of absence? Uh, there's been a few press conferences where it's sort of been touched on, but it's been hit on the head pretty quickly. Where Fags goes, look, there's an investigation going on. I'm not going to talk about it publicly. Let that do its thing and. We'll get around to it when we need to, but it's definitely it's definitely an asterisk there that who knows when when it's going to pop back up because I think what well, was a Gill wanted it all done by Christmas, but now it's it's definitely going to bleed into the season and you know who knows round fifteen it might all come exploding out and derail the season or oh, so I don't know if it'll get done by Christmas this year because yeah. there's been no talk of it down here at all. So it's yeah. almost, look, it's oh, been right. done in the background, but there hasn't been anything being brought up in the media about it, which normally says one or two things. The investigations are underway and there hasn't been any leaks, which I find very, very rare. Or it's just just gone to a bit of a stalemate and it's just going to take a lot longer than a lot of people thought. So we'll leave that one, leave that one to go because I want to talk about your mob. A couple of things that we have to quickly talk about. Average age of your team is 25 and one four years. So you've got the third oldest list, but you also have the fourth average games played at 79.69. So you are right. You, you, you've only got maybe a year or two to go before that sort of tips over. But funny enough, you have a look at the mob we won at last year. They tipped over many, many years ago, and they still dominated everybody. They certainly did. I mean... They pulled our pants down in the prelim and then went one step further with Sydney the week later. So 
they plan their season to the absolute minute, it would appear, and uh, got the job done and made a laughing stock out of a lot of people on this very podcast that's, you know, referred to Geelong as the retirement home and all that sort of stuff. So, you know what? That's it. I'm never doubting Geelong again. And I probably shouldn't have had ever because they've been at the top of the league for however many years, missed the finals once in a blue moon. And then just happened to bring in what? Four <laughs> first rounders this year. Yeah. It's, um, you know, we've had a good off season, but they've had just as good. They've been bringing Jack Bowes with pick seven, you know, a couple of other first rounders. They've, uh, they've done all right. You've done, they've done very, very well. Your, your degree of difficulty when it comes to your uh, draw for the year is the fifth hardest, which you sort of expect if you're going to make a prelim, yeah. it's going to be a lot more difficult. You play the Crows twice, Collingwood twice, Fremantle twice, Gold Coast, Melbourne, and St. Kilda. So from the team that you, you know, do the old Liz Smiley ski double up. You've actually come out quite nicely there. The ones that you'd be looking at probably would be Collingwood. Funny enough, I'm looking at Gold Coast. I think they're going to get a bit more of a peak this year. Anderson signed up. King comes back. If Chole and Casbolt can continue what they did last year and they just get another year into those, I won't even say kids anymore. They're young men. Uh, that's going to be nice. And then you've got my mob, obviously, in Melbourne as well too. You mentioned Port Adelaide is your first game away. Then you play the D's at home, Western Bulldogs away, and Collingwood at home. So that's a very, very important first four games, which easily could go both ways, yeah. to be honest. Uh, and then your last three, Adelaide at home, Collingwood away, and then St. Kilda at home as well. So from a draw perspective, I know it says it's the fifth hardest, but in terms of who you play twice and that starting four is actually, it's not bad. It's what you'd expect from a team that, that played in the prelim last year. A hundred percent, and I'd be I'd be happy if we can go three and one in that in that first four. I uh, don't ex- like if we go four and zero, oh, brilliant. But um, I know how we go, especially against the D's in home and away. Uh, speaking of getting our pants pulled down, um, and I feel like if uh, Jake Lever isn't still spinning around in that forward pocket at the MCG, um, <laughs> they're going to want some retribution for that that semi final. Look, I, I was at that game. I'll I'll be genuine. Melbourne looked magnificent probably for the first quarter and a half. I thought, here we go. They're going through the middle. The speed was on, et cetera. And then the wheels just fell off completely. And that didn't surprise us at all because it was falling off week after week in the back end. And I think it was due to uh, fitness, injury, a, a multitude of a multitude of things. So they'll definitely be looking to, to get some retribution against your mob. This guy named Lockie Neal, he was a, a couple of votes off another Brownlow. Uh, I, I saw him. In a final, basically do nothing for a first part and then rack in 40 touches in the second half. He was just an, an absolute jet. But what I'm more impressed with was the guy who came second, the uh, the McCluggage himself. We yeah. love him down here, McCluggage. It's just a name that just rolls off the tongue. Um, how, Im- how important is he to just that overall mix? It, and from his consistency perspective, I think it was the best year he's had uh, ever since joining. What is the what's the news and the, and the rumors about him and, and how he's tracking this preseason as well? Well, I mean, last year he played a little bit more inside, especially towards the back end of the year. He's always been a, a winger who's played a little bit inside, but I think those ratios have sort of gone a little bit more fifty fifty. And I think this year, twenty twenty three, we'll probably see him inside even more. So, I think he is he's definitely one of one of our better players, averaging sort of mid twenties. But his ball use is is really, really good, especially those kicks inside 50. If he, can, if he can tidy up his goal kicking, he'll almost be basically the complete midfielder. He doesn't yep. need to rack up those 30s and 40s that Neil does to have the same effect. Yeah, he's a gun. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about Will Ashcroft. Like, what have you heard up there as well too? Because, look, we hear the name. We know he probably could have, he could have played a year earlier. He just pretty much dominated everything when it came to accomplishments throughout his, his last year of junior footy. What have you heard up there? What have you seen about how he's attacking it this year? And what's the feeling within the club about it as well? Yeah, I mean, I mean the talk's always positive. It's, you know, it always is around a, a pick number one. And um, as you said, he, he basically picked up any award that he possibly could have last year. He played a couple of games for, the, for our VFL team last year. And again, sort of low to mid-20s, but... I think his defensive aspect was probably the thing that impressed me the most. Later, you know, sort of six to eight tackles per game, which was pretty important when we haven't necessarily had a lot of midfielders willing to do that. So 
Dunkley's going to be good for that, but I think Ashcroft will be will be all right for that as well. I'm not. I mean, I'm hoping he can have a Dacos style first year, but he's he's very much modelled his game on Gary Ablett Jr. A lot of um a lot of one twos, so he does rack up the numbers that way. So he'll loop a handball over, run past, get it back, and then do a kick inside fifty or have a, a pot shot on goal, which. I think a lot of, if you look at, look at a lot of his highlights, it's a lot of that type action. So he has watched a lot of Gary Ablett Jr., which, you know, if you're going to model off at anyone, it's not a bad one. You might as well. You might as well. Um, and I just think he's just going to add another dimension to it as well, too. You, you, you throw him in, it just lightens the load. I think the difference between him and Dacos, though, is I know Collingwood had a, a really good season this year. Funny enough, I spoke to the Collingwood guys quite recently, and they weren't as optimistic this year. Figure that one out. They they're not optimistic at all, and, and they went through the reasons for it, etc. Yeah, I think it's going to be okay. You have a look at that midfield. Having those bigger bodies around him is going to make it easier. Where other clubs, where number one draft picks have come in, high draft picks have come into midfields, and there's no one to support. They get, you know, Patrick Cripps, perfect example, comes in, gets smashed, pillar to post, and then five, six years down the track, shoulders start to play up, knees start to play up because he's had to carry that load. If he can just, once again, do what he needs to do and have those um, more experienced guys take a lot of the load, he's just going to excel out of that uh, because he's not going to be as, as bashed up in the body as well too. There's a guy wearing number 31 for your mom. I can't work him out. Harris Andrews. It, it, is it, sometimes I look like he doesn't care and then yeah. there's other days he just, just dominates. Can can you just explain it to me? Because I, I at the moment when they say he's you know he's one of the premier fullbacks, I've watched a number of games last year and I haven't been able to see it. Is there something going on? Uh, he just didn't look like the the Andrews that dominated probably for a, a couple of years beforehand. Well, yeah, that's right. He he made back to back AAs in nineteen and twenty, and then yeah, it's just. I don't know if it's just the way that he moves is so laconic. He just sort of lumbers up to contests and relies on his reach to get to get balls but he hasn't been the sort of intercept mark type that we're used to seeing so can i explain it i wish i could but i'm hoping i'm hoping now and i don't know if it's got anything to do with the fact that marcus adams sort of did take that number one intercept marking position over the last couple of years and then harris sort of had to find a different position like into like sort of floated a bit more. He didn't necessarily have, all right, this is my man. It's everyone else has a man and I'll help out when I can, but I'm just here to float and pick off if I can. So now without Marcus Adams, I wonder if he'll go back to that sort of original position and flourish again. But honestly, it's anyone's guess. Yeah. And it's also another guess as well when you have a look at your forward line as well, because <laughs> you've got the, uh, the pseudo twin towers down there of Hipwood and Danaher, which when it works, it works. But when it doesn't work, it's almost a look to the side. And there was even games last year where there was no Dana Hurt and Hipwood came up and, and stood up perfectly. Now you throw Gunston in there as well. Does, is it going to make it easier? Is it going to make it harder? Um, this is, these are, I think this is the question I think where people aren't sometimes convinced is will these two be able to you know, kick a premiership score between them? Yeah. Especially if the superstar Charlie Cameron has has a, has a bad one, which doesn't yeah, happen all that often. Yeah, but when it when it's a stinker, it is a stinker. But when yeah. he's on fire, it's it's something to behold. It's, well, he had, uh, had fifty four last year, and you know, for a small forward, for any forward, yeah. cracking return, cracking return. Uh, it's, I mean, Joe Danaher, you sort of know what to expect by now. It is yeah. the the whole Joe show. You're going to get one goal, six. You're going to get some ridiculous goals that no one else is going to kick, but then he's going to miss it from 20 out straight in front. So yep. he's always going to be an anomaly. I'm, I'm really hoping Hipwood can stand up this year. He's back from the ACL. Like it took him, it took him a good eight weeks to really find form after coming back last year. But by the time the finals rolled around, he had a good game against you blokes and yep. he had a, another good game against the, uh, the Tigers the week before. A little bit quiet against Geelong, but everyone was. Everyone was quiet that day. But he's played 127 games. That's the thing that sort of jumped out at me. I'm like, he's only 25. He'll be 26 halfway through the season, roundabouts. Like, he's, he's hitting his prime now, so he's got that core underneath him. Yeah. He, so I'm he's, thinking, I'm hoping, he's definitely right to step up. Yeah, I'm hoping it's going to be like 
this year and next year are going to be the best Eric Hipwood you're probably ever going to see. So it, it better be good. Um, and he's he's signed on another he's signed a long term deal in the off season. I think he's yep. at the end of twenty thirty or something to that effect. So we've got him, and obviously the the coaches and the team have a lot of faith in him that he can be the man for a, for a long time to come. But yeah, as you said, we brought in Gunston, who he's coming off a back injury, but his last six games or something, he was good for two goals a game. So I think he'll be pretty serviceable, and I think he'll be up there with our leading goal kickers. Oh, and I think with Gunston, regardless, well, so what is he age wise? I think he's, he's thirty one. Thirty one, but you, we just know what he's like. You still have to put someone to him. Yeah, and I think that's going to just take a little bit more pressure off. Okay, even if it's the sixth best defender, which you'd normally he goes up there going, oh, geez, what much do? We might have to put someone a little bit more because you just know he can get away, and the fact that he can kick and kick accurately, and you know, before you know it, he's kicked four or five, and you, you don't even see it. But that just gives y- your other forwards. We spoke about Charlie, you got Zach Bailey, uh, you got Fullerton's running around as well too. Uh, Kai Loman, I'll ask about him in a moment too. He's only played a couple of games, but he sort of stood out a little bit towards the end of the year as well too. Um, Kalamar Cheese there running around too. Cam Rayner, like he, you've actually, when you look at it, you've got a luxury of where do you put Cam Rayner now? Well, it's weird you say that because he's been playing off the half back in the off season in all the pracky matches and all the match sims. They're playing him off the half back, and I don't know why because he's. Obviously, a, a very decent midfielder, very decent forward, and we've got a plethora of halfbacks. You know, Rich, uh, Kadeen Coleman, who had a breakout season last year, he did definitely. Um, Stasevic, Darcy Wilmot, the uh, the young fella as well. So I don't know that there's necessarily room for him down in that halfback line, but it would be nice if he could be a, a player that could go across all the lines. Yeah, and Wilmot came in during that final series, and he just slotted in. Brilliantly, like yeah. I said, the game I saw him play down at the the G uh, against the D's. Just you know, you, you look at this bloke; he's playing his second game. Didn't look out of place whatsoever. So you know, they're the ones that you sit back and go, "He's nineteen, he slots in, and he's only going to get better with another preseason under him." Brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff. Um, all right. What can you tell us about the, the track watch at the moment? So who's been lighting it up? So is it, you know, with all these names, I'm seeing lots of rookie names. I'm seeing some young blokes on here. Who are some names that at the moment that are setting it alight or we, we need to look out for as like a perfect example would be Darcy Wilmot. Like start of the year, if you said, watch out for this kid, you were right. Have you heard anyone at the moment that's, that's come on board that you go, oh, yeah. I'll you. Funnily enough, there's all the talk. And I don't know whether it's just because they default to a name that people know of in the media, but all the talk has been about Dane Zorko. His last three preseason, yeah, I know, and I made that same face as well, but he's dropped a few kegs. He looks fit. He's up, and this may not mean a, a lot to people that aren't sort of intimate with the Lions, yep. but in the running groups, the time trials and stuff, he's up there with Jared Berry, Hugh McCluggage, and Harry Sharp, who have been blitzing the time trials every, every year, and Dane Zorko. He's had that Achilles, he's had the knee, he's had the ankle, but now he's back. He's seen some guru here and he's lost some weight. I don't know whether it's, um, you know, people are quick, you know, want to write him off. You know, he's old, he's a shit captain, and, you know, he's definitely had his moments, as you'd know. Um, maybe he's just got a big chip on his shoulder and he wants to come back. But all the, all the talk has been like, yeah, he's, a, he's had his best preseason, he's training the house down, all those, all those cliches. So I'll be interested to see if it, if it translates to the season proper. Yeah, because we know he's, we had his issues playing wise. Sometimes it just looked like, mate, just focus on the game and not worry about all the other bullshit that's been going around. Um, so if, whether it's he's he's had a good out look at himself and go, like, okay, if I'm captain now, I, I really need to start acting my age. And maybe it could have been not acting my age, but acting what a captain should. Yeah, and maybe that that big final loss last year was almost that. Hey, there's no point going all the way and getting to this point and getting blown off the park. Maybe we want to have a good hard look at myself and see what I can do to make myself better and make the standards even better than they, they are normally. Well, I'm sort of ho- like... I'm not we hope so. We yeah, hope so. Yeah, obviously, but I am hoping that he's not captain this year and he doesn't sort of have to balance that and he can just concentrate on playing some good footy. Yep. Um, 
and then get someone like Neil in for a captain for a year or two before a Harris or a Jared Berry take over, or even a Cam Rainer, perhaps. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Nakai Cockatoo. Yes. We're, we're, you know, if, if um, one of our follow podcasters, uh, a yank on the footy, all over the way in the, the US, favorite, this is his favorite player, Barnum. Yeah. Bigger yet, he goes, that's the guy I fell in love with, Nakai Cockatoo. Yep, blew me off the park when I heard about it as well too. But um, he had a couple of interrupted seasons and he sort of got a bit of momentum throughout last year. Heard much about him? Is he tracking okay? It's so strange. He, he we, we got him at the start of 2021, didn't play for the first half, sort of made a, a regular contribution towards the back half of the year, then had his first full preseason and God knows how many. Yep. Played the first couple of rounds and then never to be seen again. And then got delisted. And then they and, rookied him again. And then rookied him again. So I don't know what, what is happening, whether he's just not part of Faves' plan, he's not ticking a certain box, but he doesn't seem to be a regular member of the, the 22, 23, or whatever it is now. And, but he's not a bad bloke to have running around in the two. Well, if you've got a 185, 92 keg, Backman, midfielder, slot player if you need, just at your disposal in case something goes wrong. You can't ask for much more about that. But I have to ask you something which is totally outside of this. Can you give me your opinion? And I want to hear this from another football lover. The rookie list. Like, mm. There's one thing that I changed. The rookie list, the, what it is now and what, it's a, what it was brought in for is completely gone too far to the right. How is it that you're able to rookie a guy that's played 161 games for the club in Ryan Lester? There's got to be something wrong with the – it's yep. not good enough to be on the list. It's almost like, well, we're not good enough to pay you a really good wage, but we'll just keep you around. I, he is, I, he's the definition that has just – I think he's on a, maybe his fifth or sixth year of just one-year contract, and he just keeps getting them – for good, they're good bloke contracts because he's the nicest guy. He's great to have in the locker room. He'll probably captain the the VFL team this year. Um, and he's a he's a decent quality AFL player, but he's I don't, we just haven't got a spot for him. But he's, he's part the of the Lee Lee Hayes, he's every got the year. Hayes syndrome, hasn't he? Just that <laughs> yeah. nice bloke, nice bloke syndrome. Yeah, he, he's probably going to like you said do with their VFL and, and take care of that. And the barometer, another one that I just look and go, he's on the. He's on there as well too, Mister um, Mister Reese Matheson, because he was even yeah. playing like deep in the last year as well. He certainly was. I think he played that first final, and I think we dropped him for the game against you, bloke. Um, but that's just it's a stack midfield that he can't work his way into, and he played. He just played a very similar role to Jared Lyons. So once Jared Lyons dropped out of favour with the groin. Then that sort of opened the door for, for Reese to come through and then just wasn't able to hold his spot. I think he sort of put the feelers out a little bit in the off season to see if anyone wanted to throw him a bone. Mm-hmm. Obviously didn't eventuate, but yep. I mean, there'd be plenty of other teams that would love to have him in their, their starting midfield, have him line up in the circle, but it just, it, I think it's a balance thing. Like, who, who it's, it's hard, it's hard. And, and that's the thing. When you, when you have a look at your, you're starting, you're, you're starting four in the middle will be the Schnoz. He'll be in there as well too, Mr. McInerney. You're going to have Neil. You're going to have well, Dunkley. Dunkley, Dunkley slots, slots straight in. McClough, or Berry or Rayner or Bailey or Zorko, they all float through. You're, oh, we didn't even mention Ashcroft as well too. So you, you guys are really batting deep now, really batting deep. And I think that's where the pressure comes because I think if you look at the list on paper, it's probably in probably top three, top five. I mean, have you seen a list this good at Brisbane outside of the Halcyon years in the early two thousands? No, it's probably as strong as it's ever been, and I, and once again, the off seasons just strengthened it up a little bit more. So I think that's what I sort of meant at the start. It's it's got to sort of be this year, maybe next year, but it it really is sort of crunch time. That window is open. We've just got to. We've just got to tick that final box to get it done. Yeah, and if you have a look at your percentage last year, I've been going on over the, over the other previews that I've done so far, as my big indicator is what you finished on from a percentage perspective. And when you're slotting in at 119%, you know, you know you're know you getting it, 
and you yep. and you kicked some big scores last year. That's the thing as well too. So you, when you scored, you scored heavily, and just the number of options that you've got. And we mentioned Charlie Cameron earlier, and when he's on, he's on. But when he's not on, you've still got that outside uh, support, and that's where I think Gunston. You're right. He only has to kick a couple of goals a year, a couple of goals a week, but he'll kick you forty for the season. So if Charlie gets locked down and he only kicks forty for the year, and Danaher doesn't do as much. You're still going to be generating outside of Gunston. And then we haven't talked about Bailey. We haven't talked about Lions. We haven't talked about that type of group as well. So it's your back line looks amazing. Your midfield is deep. And your forward line, there's almost no excuses. If you were looking at Brisbane round one and you're Port Adelaide, you're like, normally we were able to find a gap or two. But at the moment, you plugged it up beautifully over that offseason. Yeah, it's it's... It's a nice but concerning feeling to have not too many holes in the list. So, and kicking a score has never been the issue for the Lions, especially over the last couple of years. And we've won just as many home and away games as anyone, like even as many as Geelong over the last four or five years, but just haven't been able to get the job done in, yep. the, in the month that matters. So I think the defense is really what let us down last year, not just the back six, but the team defense. And that, that, that was the huge difference between a team like Geelong and us. It's like that whole team bought into the team defense. They knew exactly what to do when we got the ball or when anyone else got the ball. They knew exactly where they were going. Whereas we just didn't have that. We didn't have that mindset for the midfielders. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing we need to work on. Not the list, but the structure. Structure? Yeah. So from an assistant coach's wise perspective, obviously you had that big loss in the, in the prelim. Any structural changes from a coaching perspective that they've brought in to maybe uh, work work through it, work around it, try and change it up a little bit? What have you heard? How they, what what the sort of game plan is that they're rolling out for the year? Well, no, no ins and outs. Uh, yeah. But Jed Adcock, who was taking care of the forwards, is now taking care of the back six, and Murray Davis, who was doing back six, is now taking care of the forwards. So they've done a bit of a swap. Who knows what sort of effect that's going to have? Uh, Murray Davis is a very good coach, and I know the back six is pretty upset to to lose him. So, yep. um, hopefully, they know what they're doing without him, and Jed Adcock can just add to that. But yeah, not not a huge amount of change there. There's no legend. So it's basically, hey guys, we we got to this far, and you're right. No one was going to stop the hoops last the last year. And look, I got it wrong. I was saying retirement homes. I was saying uh, pick him up from the the. The, the Geelong retirement home, taken to the ground, dropping back off, no night games because we passed their bedtime, all that sort of stuff last year. And we all look like complete bull. Yeah. Looking at it this year, do you see it the same? So in terms of Brisbane having to take that next step. So if they turned up against Geelong prelim final weekend again, and look, that possibly could happen. Will the scars of Christmas past, past strike back again? Like, is it? Is it a little bit like that? You've got to win at the G. You've got to win at the G, and you finally won at the G this year. Yeah, it wasn't a bad day to do it either. It wasn't a bad day to do it. Thank you very much. But <laughs> was it um, because of all the prelims? You know, you've got to quite, quite you know, a few prelims recently where it just hasn't ticked over. Yeah. Do you think that's starting to creep into the minds this year, or do you think that hold on, no, no, we're we're better for this? The additions that we've got, we're another year older, another year strengthened. Where do you see? Where, what will they have to do from what you've seen to take that next step to get to that final Saturday in September? Well, that and yeah, I, I hope it is the latter and that we have learned um, sort of what is required, what we need to do to take that next step rather than get to the, the same stage and freeze up again and pack our deck. But I think it's what I mentioned at the start it's the intangibles. Maybe it's just something, the mental fortitude, we just haven't got that. Whatever it is that we just don't have, yep. And maybe that's where we, you know, Chris Fagan. For all everyone says about him, he's a is a perfect man manager and empathetic and all that sort of stuff. Maybe in those moments we need someone to come in and wait, oi, pull your socks up. This is what we need to do. Bloody go out and do it. Or, or maybe it's that team defense that we've needed to work on. Maybe, maybe it's just luck. Who knows? <laughs> Answer this for me, and you know if the Brisbane Brisbane supporters hear this. I'd love to hear them if they want to drop something on the Facebook page, etc. But 
Fagan looks like, okay, we're, we're rolling out with this plan and I'm leaving it in the hands of the players to work out. But when it starts to go a little bit awry, is it the way that I perceive it, it doesn't look like a lot of changes are getting made. Where some, some coaches can be quite visual in terms of, okay, I need this done, I need this done. They're on the mic. Yep. Always looking at him. He's always just studying. He's not barking down a microphone, make this change, make this change. Do you, do you leave a lot of it in the hands of the players and his assistants to make those decisions? Because he doesn't seem, how do I say it, from a match day coach, he yeah. doesn't seem as animated and as vigorous as others. Yeah, you're right. There doesn't seem to be a huge sense of urgency about him. The only thing you can sort of really notice is that he'll chew that gum a little bit harder, a little bit faster and give it a real noshing. But um, I think he does leave a lot of it to his assistant coaches and he just sort of man manages from the bench. He's always yep. been a bench coach, but I don't know whether there's any truth to this or it was just a, a throwaway line, but he was considering going up to the box to coach this year. Okay. Um, so who knows if that's got anything to do with what's been going on with him and his life over the last couple of months and he wants to stay out of the you know, public earshot or if it's just something he thinks he can, might be able to change to, to get that extra step. Who knows? But yeah, I think he does sort of leave it a lot to, to his team and he just sort of man manages from the bench. Yeah, and if it works, it works. You know, it's, it, we've seen coaches who, who have done that. Some prefer to see the high elevation. Some like to be there getting the, the instant feedback from players as they come off the ground. Whichever one works, you just sometimes sit there and go, just, can you make a change? Can you do something? What's plan B? What's plan C? I don't see it. Can, 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 you, can you do something? And I think when uh, who went down in the final, it was last year quite early. Yeah, we lost Oscar McInerney very early in the first sort of three minutes against that game against um, the Tigers. Yeah. And I mean, luckily enough, McStay and, and Joe Danaher sort of shouldered the load. And it, whether it was just out of, all right, we really need to make a change here because we've lost our Ruckman and then things just sort of fell into place and it worked. And it was n not the predictive yeah. Brisbane way of playing. They had to change it up a bit. Oh, Danaher looked magnificent in the Ruck. And then going down, kicking those last couple, winning the game. Great game, by the way. And by the way, for all the Richmond supporters who said it was a what was it, a goal or a point or whatever, don't care. Shouldn't have to worry about one kick being the different difference of the game. But you know, it it, it showed a bit of randomness to the way that your yeah. forward structure was, and you'd hope to see a little bit more of that you know, moving throughout the season. Because, like you said, when it's stagnant and it's predictable, if it's not if it's predictable to you. I'm tipping it's going to be predictable to the people who line up against you uh, week in week out as well. And I think this is where the new sub rule might actually help someone like Fagan as well, who's loved two rucks but sort of hasn't had the luxury of being able to play them each week. So I think now that we've got that 23rd man or the new sub rule, however that's implemented, he might be more inclined to put Darcy Ford in that position. So we do have a backup in case McInerney goes down again in the, the first couple of minutes or whatever. It's going to be interesting how teams attack that new sub rule because they can bring them on at any particular time. Will they go an extra tall, extra midfielder, someone who's a utility? I'm, I'm excited to sort of see how some teams are going to play out with that. Are you a fan of the new sub rule or would you, you would prefer to just have five on the bench? Uh, I'm, it doesn't seem, I mean, yes, there's been an official change, but I think, I mean, clubs were taking the piss, surely. It's like, oh, yeah, no, nah, he's injured. He won't be able to play next week. Oh, suddenly he's all right for oh, next week. Oh, he's okay. Yeah. yeah. If, if um, they made a hard and fast answer, if, you're, if you sub your person off, they weren't allowed to play yeah. a week later. Certainly. Some teams didn't even sub anyone off. Some teams are doing it week in, week out. So I, I think I probably would have just preferred five on the bench, but then we'd, we'd be here 12 months later and the coaches be like, well, five's not enough. We need a, a six sub. Yeah, oh, it's not fair because one of them gets injured. Well, you know, it's a game of attrition. Deal with it, all right? Suck yeah. it up, princesses or princes, depending on which prince or princess side you look at. All right, let's have a look at it. These are the questions that we need to have a look at. So if you have a look at the playing list um, at the moment, uh, who who's going to surprise us this year? So who do you think at the moment you're going, oh, this guy's actually going to, to rise up the ranks a little bit and um, – Attack it hard for us that we, we didn't see coming. And it might be a name that exists or it might be someone that we've not even heard of before. Yeah, I think 
I think the three that come to mind is Jack Payne is now going to be best twenty two yep. for the season. I don't th- I don't think we'll ever see Marcus Adams take the field again. To be fair, which is a shame, like, isn't it? Like to go, to not be really, able to play because of a, a concussion. Like we've all probably had one once in our day, whether it was deliberate, whether it was accidental, etc. But it's not a it's not a great feeling. It's to know that you're losing your career because of what you what you were doing. That's yeah. That's tough. So you know. Our thoughts and wishes go out to him. But I think now that Jack Payne is, will be in the team week in, week out, he's always been that first emergency when we've got an injury and he's always been in the team, out of the team. I think a bit of continuity will be, be good for him. He's a tremendous athlete but hasn't got the greatest footy smart. Yep. So I'm hoping he can just sort of learn on the job and learn quickly. Um, Kadeen Coleman sort of caught the attention of a few yes. people last year, but I think once again, a bit of continuity, another preseason under the belt, uh, a bit of confidence as well. I think he's going to be like that. Left foot is something nice to it's watch. Nice. It's nice. <laughs> yeah. It's very nice. Um, when, when, when you're at the game, you can hear him saying "Kitty, Kitty, Kitty, K I double T Y." No, it's actually it's spelled Kadian, but it's like just said Kitty Coleman. Just makes it. Yeah, I thought it was a piss take when they were saying it, but no, it is Kitty and Coleman. And I think, um, yeah, so I think he, he'll be in for a good season. Um, I think somewhat a team tagged him last, last towards the back end of last year. And it really, I think we were in danger of really losing that game, but it, it did seem to work for them. And I think GWS tagged Daniel Rich for the same reason. And they blew us out in the first quarter as well. So um, him and Rich off the halfback is quite nice. And then if you do throw McKenna in there with a bit of speed and Darcy Wilmot with the same thing, it's looking pretty good. But, um, the other one is Eric Hipwood. We mentioned him at the start of the yep. show. Preseason under his belt, coming back from the ACL. He's entering that, you know, that 25, 26 year old, I think. I hope he's, he's due for a big <laughs> year. Um, yeah, exactly right. Find some consistent accuracy. And yeah, it, those, like I said, those two finals he played against the Tigers and you blokes, he, he looks like a genuine key forward. And I hope that, um, you know, a few more kilos and uh, a bit of confidence as well. well go I think that's that. the thing. His size was always, he was very uh, gangly. Yeah. And uh, very thin. If he can strap it on a bit and not lose that athleticism, um, once again, the guy can jump, the guy can kick. He just sometimes it's between the ears just to get that consistency as well too. But there was a guy that you mentioned that you, you, you can't be prouder than this guy, Daniel Ricks. Like he's just been heart and soul this club ever since he's come on. Yeah, and he's had plenty of bugger he off. Has, was that? He's had plenty of opportunities to bugger off in the, you know, he's been, 2009 he came, yep. and then just garbage for the best part of 10 years, and now he's ripping the benefits and made an AA a couple of years ago. So, yeah, a very and popular member. Yeah, and he's, that, you're talking about left feet, like, crikey, when he, when he shoots that cannon, good luck stopping it, because they're just bullet-like. But he had that year where he unfortunately did his knee, and then that that took a year off him. He'd be a three hundred game player at the club now. Yeah, so that's the way he's going. Is it? You reckon it's his last season? Or do you do you think that the, it depends on it's, how it's things It's hard sort to of tell. I think him year. and Zorko, if we manage to seal a flag this year, yep, that might be enough for those two to go. You know what? That's it for me. I'm going to do a Shane Crawford and go out on top. Yep. Or if we come dangerously close again and they go, all right, give us one more. But um, yeah, I think it, probably seventy percent those two last year, this year. So, it, and I think that's what you're saying when you have Dunkley and Ascroft sitting in the wings for yep. those two when they go out, and then having Rainey go down back. You know, see how it works. You, it, could, it could be this year, it could be next year. We 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 just don't know. Um, anyone else that you're looking at thinking, oh, I'll tell you what, it could be your last year. Now, it could be your last year at the club, or it could be your last year playing the great game that they love as well too. Yeah, uh, I mean, like I said, Marcus Adams, I don't think we'll be seeing him again, unfortunately. But yep. Jared Lyons is probably the other one who, I mean, he has apparently he's got a, a groin issue that sort of kept him out, but he did play some VFL. I just don't know whether he's, he's, he's quite slow. And there was a particular game against Fremantle last year where they did us over at Optus Stadium and yep. Will Brody was just walking out of stoppages and Jared Lyons was three paces behind him and I thought, yeah, he's just sort of not accountable anymore. Doesn't really lay as many tackles, more of a corralla. Um, so I don't know if, you know, unless he can really refine his form, uh, then maybe JL. But 
the other one is probably Reese Matheson. If he doesn't get a regular spot again, he's yeah. well within his rights to go. Can you please trade me to a club that's gonna play me every week? Give me a crack. Look, there'll be plenty of clubs, especially towards the bottom, that need a Reese oh, Matheson. Good time. A perfect example, Mitch Robinson could not have been a better addition to your club over what he did. And you just look at a bit of his history, and I've had a look at some of his videos on his um, YouTube channel. If you haven't had done if, if you haven't done that, regardless if you don't follow it, he's an absolute ripper. And I didn't realise as much about his background. Forgot that he actually won a best and fairest at your club as well, too. He yeah. was he he's that player that you just want to be behind because you know he's going to give everything. People don't like him. I reckon you, you, once you see them in a different light, you go, he's just, he's just, he just does it for you. And such so a yeah. shame that Reese Matheson sort of gives me a bit of that, but you want to see more of it on the field as well. Yeah, big time. And uh, I was one of those people that couldn't stand Mitch Robinson before he came over to the Lions and then yep. did a full 180 on him. Fantastic club man. And um, I think he's, gonna, he's got a contract at Morningside now, so he's just going to play some local footy. And Good on him. Yeah, you you can't miss him. He'll be on YouTube. He'll be on, you know, Channel Seven doing all sorts of stuff. You won't be able to miss Mitch Robinson. And you know what? Um, a little bit of Mitch Robinson in your life is not exactly uh, a bad thing. It's actually quite good. All right, let's uh, let's put it on the line right now. Who do you think is going to take out? Actually, from a teams wise, teams outside of your own, who do you think the climbers are going to be, and who do you think the sliders are going to be? Who's the uh, the double ups from that perspective? Uh, I mean, the obvious answer for climbers has got to be Gold Coast and Carlton. I think yep. Carlton were very stiff to miss out on the eight last year, as, as everyone knows. I think they'll, I think they'll definitely play finals. Might even sneak into a top four. I think the Suns they'll they'll probably sneak into the back end of the eight, anywhere yep. between sort of sixth and eight. Well, I'll give you uh, a heads up for anybody, just really quickly. Tommy Roker, who I did the Gold Coast uh, preview, has written to finish in the top. Sure, he's he's very very confident. And he went through some he went through some statistics, and he actually had quite a compelling argument. Um, probably oh, a I think that'd be higher than I thought, but I think it'd be fantastic for the competition if that does happen. And there is always one. There is always, always one, one that rockets up. And last year it was Collingwood, so I think they'll probably. I think they were very lucky last year. There's no way you can get by and sneak into top four with just just over a hundred percent, if that. Um, 102. <laughs> there you go. So I don't think they can, like, power to them if they can, but surely that luck has to run out and they're not going to win as many close games. And Sydney's the other, other close watch as well. Not many uh, teams come back from an absolute pantsing in the grand final and, and can back it up. So those two yeah. are the top ones that I think they'll probably still both play finals, but I don't know they'll be top four lot. Well, that's an interesting thing because if you're saying someone like Carlton goes in and Gold Coast goes in, then two have to drop out as well. And then you're looking at the list and you've only got, well, you've got Geelong, you've got Melbourne, you've got Sydney, third, Collingwood, Brio, Brisbane, Richmond, and the Dogs. So you look, at, you look at that and you go, oh, who's going to drop out? There's probably two that stand out to me. Based on what you've said, which I would, in my eyes at the moment, probably be maybe Frio, maybe the Bulldogs. I think with the Bulldogs losing losing Dunkley, it, it's going to put just more pressure. But they've got such a good forward line moving forward. So I don't yeah, know what's Lock- going to happen from them. And Frio, I'm uh, still not convinced. Yeah, Lockie Hunter went to you guys as well. So they did. Yes. They did have a deep midfield, but they did shed a few as well. So I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the Dogs drop out. And yeah, Collingwood, Frio, perhaps. But yeah. Freo, Freo's list seems in good order, and I, I do like um, Justin Longmuir. Yeah, he's pretty good. Pretty good. All right. So, who's going to take it out? If you had to look at it now, if you had to pick one, pick two, who's got? Who's your eyes on the fries? Who's going to be taking out the big one at the end of 2023? In your humble opinion. I mean, I'm reluctant to say it, but it's sort. Of, and I preface the whole show with it. It sort of has to be us, <laughs> out, of, out of necessity, because it. I'm I'm worried if we don't do it this year or next year, but mostly this year, then it's another going to be another ten years of pain and sorrow. Yeah, but, and I, you know what? I don't think people would be too upset if Brisbane won it. I think well, if I hope you, not. And when I say upset, it's like you know, it's oh, not them again. Yeah. Aka okay, Geelong. Uh, it'd be nice to to see Brisbane because they've been up there and they've they've been playing prelims and they just haven't been able to take that next step. 
So if they can come back after losing like they did last year, I know we'll be doing this in 2024, and you, the other arm will be full with <laughs> just everyone's names all the way down. I think I think you blokes will be up there again. I think Richmond will will give it a good crack as well. And I mean, yeah, you can't can't count out Geelong. I think that'll probably be the top four: us, Geelong, Melbourne, Richmond, and that's nice in some sort of order there. I like it. I like it very much. And you know what? I actually like you very much as well too, Mister Book, because you are an absolute superstar. Um, what's going on with you? What what plans have you got uh, for the broadcasting over the uh, twenty twenty three season? Uh, so I'll be doing the Brecky Show on Rebel FM each and every weekday between Monday and Friday. You can check that out at rebelfm.com.au. Doing the sports show where I will be chatting footy each and every Saturday as well between 11 and 1. Uh, as well with, you know, it's Queensland, so there's got to be some NRL chat and whatever else goes on in the world of sport. And, uh, How sport much do they hate the Melbourne Storm up there? In- <laughs> <laughs> I guess it would be the equivalent of... Uh, 2001 to 2003, where everyone hated the Lions Fair in enough. Melbourne. Oh, so. I don't think we hated Brisbane, to be honest. We just loved the way that they played footy. We, we did. We loved the way that they played footy. It was hard. It was tough. Voss getting in your face. Brown just doing everything you can. Acker doing handstands. It was beautiful. We loved it. So don't, don't think about it like that. We, 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 a lot of respect. A lot of respect. Um, and so that's pretty much it from, from Mondays to Fridays, Saturdays as well, too, with the yeah. sports reviews yet. And yeah, that'll stuff. that'll keep me busy uh, over the, the next however long, and um, just counting down. You know, I mean, preseason fixtures released today on day of recording, so that's yep. something to look forward to. And then it's something to look forward to. Who, you got, who have you got in your two warm up games? Sydney and Geelong. So there you go. Oh, a couple, a couple of easy ones to, to warm up with. Uh, you, couldn't um, ask for, you couldn't ask for a better two to go against as well, too. Yeah, it, it really just depends on how seriously each team takes it. No, I agree wholeheartedly. But there's one thing that we take seriously, and that is our 2023 Brisbane Lions season preview. I have actually got your top four, by the way. I have actually got you in our top four for the year, I reckon. The additions, um, any gaps that you had, you filled them beautifully. You've got an absolute star-studded midfield now, a forward line that many teams would dream of, and a back line, like I said. You've just got – when you've got it to a point that you can pick your best 22 out of probably 28 to 30. You know your list is in good shape because if you do lose three or four, you've still got more at your disposal than others as well too. So I think Brisbane are going to have a cracking year and it would not surprise me if they were if I was watching them live on the last Saturday in September. So, Mr. James Brooks, uh, my magnificent... Uh, Brisbane Lions superstar. And by the way, thank you very much for joining us again. The feedback last year about what you provided to all our Brisbane supporters was um, sensational. So we had love to have you back, and I really appreciate you taking out your time because it is an early start for you on uh, most weekdays as well too. But I have one question and one question only, and it is simply this. How do you want your footy? I want it lace out, Peps. There you go, listeners. Have a great year. Go Lions. And I'll tell you what, if you're not listening to Rebel FM in the morning, you should be because Miss James is an absolute star. Take care, listeners. Thanks for listening to our latest episode. If you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes. I'm your host, Chris Pepper, and with Jamie Wallace, we give you your footy how you want it. Ice out.